So this is the fourth in a series of messages called Fixer Upper. We're talking about how we fix up our minds so we think differently so that we can experience the true joy and happiness that Christ uh, gave us. I'll just give you a couple examples uh, with how we can experience happiness even though things don't go well. One is, uh, you know, uh, Charles Barkley's been talking about the Blazers the last uh, couple weeks, like, you know, they're going to the finals, and uh, so, you know, we had a lot of hope for them, and then they've kind of hit a wall last two games against Golden State. Uh, looked like they were going to win them both and lost lost them both, and so it uh, doesn't mean uh, everything's going to go great in your life uh, to experience uh, this uh, joy that Christ is talking about. Other one is much more personal. Uh, I try to go uh, water skiing with my friend uh, every Friday. Friday at the uh, West Lynn um, Slalom course, and uh, I had, we always have to have three guys, and the, the guy I had going uh, dropped out on Thursday afternoon, so I was scrambling and uh, to find somebody, so I ended up taking Erica, our uh, daughter, and uh, Erica has cerebral palsy, if, if you don't know, and anyway, so my friend and I used the restroom, and uh, the boat was uh, parked uh, you know, on the trailer, and Erica thought she'd speed things up by climbing up and getting in the boat and making me all proud, and so she climbed up, and she fell, and she chipped three teeth and cut her chin, and you know, I just felt so horrible, and um, and uh, so I call her my little dolly, and uh, she, was, she was hurting. So uh, s sad things can happen, but we're talking about what we can experience even though those things happen. Our family has enjoyed watching the show Fixer Upper. <clears throat> How many of you have watched the show Fixer Upper? I just want to know who I'm addressing here today. Okay, uh, they, uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines stopped the show last May. They have five children, 14 and under, and they decided eh, this show maybe is not the best for our kids, and so they're kind of reevaluating. Uh, but the reason the show has become so popular is because everybody enjoys a before and after story. You take a house that's dilapidated and run down and turn it into a beautiful home it's just, that's just a great story. We also like life transformation stories. Take somebody from lost to found. Take somebody from messed up to stable. Move somebody from unhappy to happy. My assessment is that most people aren't happy. At least when I ask somebody how they're doing, from the responses I get, I'm not very convinced they're happy. Now, everybody's happy once in a while, some of the time, uh, but what I believe is that less people are experiencing the happiness they could, and more people are exuding more unhappiness than they should. So this series is in, on fixing up the way we think so we can experience the joy, the true happiness that Christ came to give us. Now, when I talk about happiness, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not just talking about smiling and laughing, joking, and having a good time. I do mean all of those things, but the happiness that the Bible describes is something deeper. It's more profound. I mean, there are many people that have experienced what we would call the good life. But they've experienced a relatively scant amount of fun and enjoyment. I mean, among those that have experienced the good life, you could name people like Abraham Lincoln, Louis Pasteur, Martin Luther King, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Pope John the 23rd. Hardly, you know, they experienced the good life. They, they made, you know, breakthroughs and discoveries. They were leaders. They were well known. But hardly anyone would say their lives were filled with fun and enjoyment. To say such a thing is to kind of obscure the whole notion of what happiness really means. So let me give you some synonyms for what I'm talking about when I talk, when I use the word happiness. A synonym would be joy. Another one would be peace. Another one would be satisfaction. 
or the word I'm using most in this series, true happiness. You can experience that, those things, even in a life that's not easy. Now, all of you, whether you're a teenager or a parent, single or married, Christian or not a Christian, want happiness. So how do we get it? For our instruction, we're turning to the book of Philippians. If you want to use our Bibles under the seats, it's on page 1178. Apostle Paul writes this letter to the Philippians in 62 AD from a prison cell in Rome. Paul's life has not been easy. Everywhere he's gone, he's been hated, opposed, often beaten, many times thrown in prison, In his travels, a number of times he was shipwrecked. Yet in this book, he mentions his joy 19 times. How in the world does he experience true happiness in those circumstances confined to a prison cell? Well, the answer comes in another word he uses 16 times in this book, the word mind. The secret of Christian joy comes in the way we think. Look at the way he thinks. Read this with me, verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. So he's in prison in Rome rather than complaining about it, whining about it, saying, ah, now I can't plant churches, I can't preach... (coughs) the gospel, instead he's talking about, you know what? Being in this prison is actually advancing the gospel. I have all these guards I can speak to every day. I have officials from Caesar's court that I'm now in contact with. And then uh, read with me verse 18. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He rejoices that the gospel is spreading now in the prison, and that people outside of prison are picking up his work and planting churches and preaching Christ. In this letter, uh, Paul kind of, it's built around five wrong ways of thinking and five right ways of thinking. Let's just review them uh, for a minute. So a wrong way to think is to think that my circumstances dictate my happiness. If I'm sick, if I have a lot of stress, if I've lost a loved one, if I've got a problem with a family member, of course I can't be happy. Paul says that's the wrong way. To think. The right way to think is to be God centered in your thinking. You think, well, what can God do in this situation? What can He bring out of that? That's what Paul does. He's in prison and he thinks, well, what can God do through this situation? What good can He bring out of it? Now, the second wrong way to think is to think, people cause my problems. You say, you know, if I just didn't have such strict parents, then I'd be happy. Or if my kids weren't just so disobedient, then I'd be happy. Or if I didn't have such an awful boss. Or if I didn't have uh, such a nagging wife. Or if my husband would just listen, he never listens. Then I'd be happy. Paul says that's the wrong way to think. You'll never be happy if that's the way you're thinking. The right way to think is to think of others as more important than yourselves. You view them as very important and treat them that way. You view them as who they can become in Christ, what Christ can do in their lives, and it revolutionizes the way you think about other people, and you can't let them rob you of your joy anymore. Another wrong way to think is to think negatively. Something happens, you go dark. You think of the worst possible things. The right way to think, Paul says, is to praise. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. You have a new mindset. In everything you face, you praise God, what he can do out of it. The wrong way to think is to worry. You have a problem with this? I tend to worry. The right way to think is to pray. Pray about the thing you're worried about. 
The wrong way to think is to be discontent. Never happy with what you have. You're always hoping for what you want. The right way to think, Paul says, is to learn to be content with what you have right now. Now, today I want to dig deeper in the first one, how to think in a God-centered way. Uh, this is the theme of the whole first chapter. So all four of my first messages have really been around this theme. How do you think God-centered about your circumstances? Paul does that. He's Even though he's been beaten, thrown in prison, he rejoices because he sees what God is doing. So here's the point I want to make today. If you want to experience true happiness, make serving Christ your purpose for living. Paul's not complaining in prison because his purpose for living is to serve Christ. And he realizes, I can serve Christ in prison as well as out of prison. Read with me verse 20. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Paul is in prison awaiting trial. He doesn't know if he's going to be executed. We don't know the details, but we believe Paul was beheaded in 64 AD under Emperor Nero. Is he afraid? Is he worrying? Is he complaining? No. Paul shows us that if you die, you experience joy through being with Christ. He says, well, if I'm beheaded, okay, I'll go to be with Christ. Takes away the fear of death. The truth that if we die, we go to be with Christ in heaven was shown very clearly by a guy named Todd Schulte. He wrote this when his grandfather died and read it at his memorial service. So just for a moment, picture that you're at a memorial service and you're hearing the grandson uh, speak about his grandfather. Dear Grandpa, it's been so hard to let you go. I keep remembering the times we've shared. I remember as a kid, you had a job opening a gas station. I would sneak out of bed and have breakfast with you before the sun came up. Just you, me, and the grape nut flakes. We'd talk for a while about anything, school, baseball, the good old days, and there was never a conversation without the, how have the girls been treating you? Of course, at the time, girls were the last thing I wanted to talk about. Eventually, it'd be time for you to go. You'd fill your thermos, lead me to the bedroom, and whisper, see you at lunch, Snickle Fritz, and be on your way. I'd crawl back to bed and say to myself, I want to be just like him. Well, after eight years of not giving up, I finally got the cheerleader. And I'll never forget the sparkle in your eyes. Grandpa, when I saw you during my engagement party, you walked up to Kim, put your arm around her. And from then on, the question changed from <clears throat> how have the girls been treating you to how's my boy treating you? I'm so thankful that Kim and I got to spend a week with you and Grandma this past summer. This visit was different because this time I was married. I noticed things that I had never noticed before. The love and respect you had for Grandma the inner strength you possess due to your walk with Christ, your commitment to read God's word every day, your ability to keep your eyes on heaven no matter how much pain you were in. You never felt sorry for yourself. You'd notice someone in a wheelchair and say, boy, do I have it good. Toward the end of our visit, the pain got worse and you couldn't keep your food down. But you held your spirits high and kept saying, I'm not so bad. Just imagine how Christ suffered for us. Kim and I went to bed every night telling each other how we wanted to have the same type of dedication and devotion you and Grandma have to each other and to Christ. Well, Grandpa, today you're with the Lord. And as I said earlier, it's hard to let you go. The night I found out you went home, I was a mess. One of my best friends, gone forever. But then I caught myself. We're both Christians. I'm going to see you again, maybe 50 years from now. And who knows, the Lord might decide to make it sooner than that. Yes, but 50 years is an awful long time. But what is 50 years compared to eternity, which we'll spend together in heaven? I'm so happy for you, Grandpa, because I know you'll never have to suffer again. The days of not being able to enjoy yourself because of your poor health are gone. In fact, I'll bet you're having a ball right now, 
Just look at the company you've got. David, Abraham, Moses, and Christ Jesus himself. Yes, Grandpa, I'm really happy for you. I can't wait to see you again. Love, Snickle Fritz. So Todd has, had it right. We don't need to fear death because when we die, if we believe in Christ, we know we'll go to heaven and see Christ that very day. So then you can say with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul goes on, if you live, you experience joy through serving Christ. Read with me verse 24. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Uh, if he avoids execution, he believes he'll be able to get, go, get out of prison and go visit the Philippians again to encourage them in their faith and in joy. He's trying to teach them how to experience joy like he has. If you want to experience true happiness like Paul, make serving Christ your purpose for living. Every day when you get up, you say, my purpose is to serve Christ. I try to do this every day. I try to spend uh, uh, time with Christ every day and time in the journal, time in the Bible. And then I say, Christ, I want to serve you today. And then I kind of pray through what I'm going to do that day. Help me serve you. Parents, if you want your child to discover happiness, do everything you can to lead them to Christ. Bring them to church. Have them attend kids' space. Get involved in the youth group. Go on the summer camps. If they learn to serve Christ, they will find happiness. They won't be thinking about themselves, but about serving Christ. Read with me verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. He wants them to continue to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of Christ. That's our purpose we come to Christ, we want to grow in discipleship, become more like Christ. I have a number of friends from college that, like me in college, were passionate about Christ. They decided, like I did, to go to seminary, become a pastor. But many of them chose seminaries like Yale or Vanderbilt or Harvard, where they were taught that Jesus is not the Son of God, but simply a man. And uh, they were taught that the Bible is not all true. It's filled with errors. So by the time they were done, they would come out. And they didn't know what was up. They'd lost their faith. Some of them decided not to become pastors. I think that was a good decision. But some that did, I feel sorry for the people in their churches. They remind me of this story. I've told it before. You may have heard me. And uh, this guy bought a Ferrari. And uh, he, you know, wanted to protect it. And, and so he, he looked up a Catholic priest. And he said, would you bless my Ferrari? He said, well, we don't usually do that. We don't bless inanimate objects. But, you know, we want to be relevant. So, yeah, I guess I could do that. But I got a question for you. What's a Ferrari? The guy couldn't believe it. How could a priest be that out of it? He stomped out of his office and he looked up a Baptist pastor. And he came to him and he said, would you bless my Ferrari? He says, nah, it's not really the way we do it. Uh, but, you know, we do want our church to grow. And uh, so, yeah, I guess I could do that. But I have a question for you. What's a Ferrari? This guy was shocked at a pastor could know this little about the real world so he went out and he looked up a unitarian pastor and he said hey would you bless my ferrari he said oh zero to 65 in four seconds 119 miles per hour in first gear winner of the grand prix i'd love to bless your ferrari but i have a question for you 
What's a blessing? <laughs> That's like my friends who went to these liberal seminaries. They didn't know what they thought when they got done. Under their leadership, their churches become spiritually bankrupt. Paul continues, even if you suffer, you experience joy through serving Christ. So these are interesting verses. Read with me starting at verse 28. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you were going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Paul tells them that even though they're experiencing suffering and persecution like he is, they can still know true happiness. Christ suffered for them, now they're called to suffer for him and for the gospel. When you think of suffering today, you think of Christians being persecuted, what do you think of? Maybe you think of uh, persecution of Christians on college campuses. Maybe how Christians are treated in classrooms in colleges. Maybe you think of Sri Lanka, the Christians that were killed there by terrorists. Maybe you think of the Christians that have been driven from their homes from Iraq or Syria or Iran or other countries in the Middle East. What you probably don't think about is the persecution of Christians in China. Seems like a pretty well-kept secret. But Christians have been persecuted in China ever since Mao Zedong took power in 1949, the last 70 years. In recent years, they've really cracked down on the church because they see Christians as tinder for a revolution. They've shuttered tens of thousands of churches in recent years. And they've taken uh, pastors and uh, Christians and, and thrown them in jail. This last month, I've been reading a book that Jory read uh, about persecution of, of Christians in China. Their attitudes of, you, you, when people go to visit them, they, they exude joy. Even though they've been tortured in prison, they see it as a privilege to suffer for Christ. You say, how in the world can they experience that kind of happiness in the midst of such unfair treatment? It all has to do with their attitude. They rejoice for the privilege of serving for Christ. They see their purpose is to serve Christ and they realize they can serve Christ in prison as well as when they're out in there with their freedom. They've learned to think right. In fact, more people today are becoming Christians in China than any other country in the world. When they stop a church and, and uh, destroy it or shutter it, the church just grows faster. It just grows in underground and they begin meeting in homes. The attitude of these Christians in China seems very similar to what we read about here with the Apostle Paul. No matter what experiences he faces, Paul maintains a spirit of joy. How does he do it? It all has to do with his mind. He keeps his mind focused on on serving Christ. If you want to experience true happiness like Paul, make serving Christ your purpose for living. Lord Jesus, thank you for this book of the New Testament that you have included from the Apostle Paul where he teaches us how we can experience joy, true happiness, peace in the midst of maybe difficult days, difficult times. We want that. We want to be happy. And we confess that many times we're not. We complain. We whine. We're pessimistic. We worry. Forgive us. We want to experience this happiness. We want to think better. We want to think God-centered and see serving you as our purpose for living. I want to give you a moment just to, to pray. Would you tell Christ that if this is your desire, that you want to make serving Christ your purpose starting right now. And whatever you go through this week, maybe you're facing some difficult things.
We, pr we all are. But tell him in the midst of those, you want to make serving him your purpose. You pray. Lord God, thank you for sending your son into the world. He taught us about joy, giving us your Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would help us to have that sense of joy and purpose and satisfaction no matter what we're, we're facing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.